This is the chapter on jet engine instruments. If you're flying a 172, even around in the traffic pattern, and you're having to change power settings quite a bit, if somebody put a yellow sticky over the RPM gauge, you'd still be able to fly the airplane all right. What do you do on takeoff? It's normally aspirated. That is, no turbocharger, no supercharger. You're just going to push the throttle all the way forward. Uh, you're going to leave it that way in the climb. After you level off, you can pull it back a little bit. How much exactly is not that critical. And you can feel it. You can uh, The vibration, which relates to RPM, which relates to power setting, you can hear it, which relates to RPM, which relates to power setting. You're coming in on approach, and you're reducing power. Does it have to be exactly 1,500 RPMs? No, it could be plus or minus a few hundred, not any big deal. You can always adjust it anyway if you need a little more or a little less. So you could actually fly around the traffic pattern pretty easily in a 172 without having any engine gauges at all. Of course, it'd be nice to know if the oil pressure was too low or the oil temperature was too high. But if everything was working, you could fly 172 around quite a bit without using the engine gauges. Heck, uh, cruise, what do you do? You leave the throttle all the way forward. In a turbine-powered airplane, it's a different story. The engine is farther away from the air from the cockpit. The difference in noise and vibration is going to be insignificant uh, when you're trying to set a different power setting. And you can't just push the power lever all the way forward. A jet engine is like a turbocharged or supercharged airplane engine. As you push the power lever forward, you're going to increase RPM, increase uh, thrust, and at some point you're going to hit that red line, that takeoff power setting, but you not, need to know exactly where it is. You can't afford to not have enough power. You'll take too much runway, and if you uh, push it too far forward, you'll be damaging the engine if you exceed any of the engine red lines. So you really need... Uh, the RPM gauge um, or, or other gauges when you're operating a turbine engine. It crews power settings. You're not just going to leave the power lever shoved all the way forward. You have to set an exact RPM or engine pressure ratio or torque so the aircraft will perform just like you want. So knowing what the gauges are telling you is a lot more important on turbine engines than it is in reciprocating engines. I think the most important gauge on a turbine engine is the EGT, or exhaust gas temperature. There's a lot of other names for EGT, like uh, turbine inlet temperature, intermediate turbine temperature, turbine discharge temperature, turbine outlet temperature. Uh, but we're all talking about how hot are the gases coming out of the engine, how hot are they going through the turbine section. And if you damage the turbine section by letting it get too hot, it's going to be a very, very expensive repair if you have to replace the turbine section. Uh, if you're flying a 172 and you start the engine, or I guess you'd be starting it before you're flying it, if you start the engine on a 172, how long can you wait until the oil pressure starts moving before you say, hey, there's no oil pressure, I need to shut it down? That's almost always 30 seconds, although, and in, interestingly enough, that's the same for turbine engines. Typically, if you don't get an oil pressure indication of some kind, that may not have to be in the green arc, but you need to at least see the needle start to move. If you don't get that oil pressure up within 30 seconds, then you need to shut the engine down. If you let it run past 30 seconds, then you're damaging the engine. Well, if the exhaust gas temperature gauge, I'll show you a picture of one here. Here's an exhaust gas temperature gauge. I think I got another one. Here's a turbine inlet temperature gauge. I think I'll go back to the first one. And on this one, this is an intermediate turbine temperature, so it's actually measuring the temperature between turbines. And here's the red line the, the for starting. We'll get to the why, the fact that there's two red lines here momentarily. But here's the starting red line. If we let this needle come up and go past the starting red line, then we're damaging the engine. And it doesn't take 30 seconds to do that. It doesn't take 30 seconds for the temperature to come up, and it doesn't take 30 seconds after it goes past the red line to damage the engine. A few seconds, a few seconds past this starting red line, and you just made the engine unairworthy. So, in my opinion, and of course since I'm grading the test, the most critical engine gauge on the aircraft, on a jet engine, is the exhaust gas temperature gauge, because if you don't pay attention to it in a very, very, very short period of time, you can destroy the engine and make it unairworthy. Now, you can put exhaust gas temperature probes essentially in three different places. Uh, 
on the engine. So I'll put in my generic turbine engine here and put in my EGT probes. You can put an EGT probe in front of the first turbine. This would essentially be the turbine inlet temperature. It's telling you that to gas temperature prior to hitting the first turbine. You can also put a temperature probe between them, an intermediate turbine temperature probe, which is telling you the temperature. They did the, some engineer decided to put it between somewhere between the turbine temp, turbine blades, and then the most common place. This would be turbine discharge temperature, turbine outlet temperature and EGT. And what we're going to do the rest of this class, unless I'm specifically asking you about it, EGT is talking about any of these three gauges. It just varies by where they put them in your aircraft. Now as the air travels through the engine, the TIT, the turbine inlet temperature gauge, is going to be exposed to the highest temperature. The intermediate turbine temperature is going to be exposed to a slightly less temperature. And the turbine discharge temperature, turbine outlet temperature, and or EGT gauge is going to be exposed to the least or coolest temperature. So if I want, if they were all the exact same temperature probe, I'd probably, and, you, and most engine manufacturers do, put their exhaust gas temperature probe after the last turbine blade if you're standing outside the engine. Not only can you see the last turbine blade, but you can see the, the EGT probes. And if you look up the back of a turbine engine, you usually see multiple exhaust gas temperature probes, and we'll get to that on the next slide. Here's a EGT gauge out of a Pratt & Whitney PT6 turboprop. It's an ITT, intermediate turbine temperature, so they're putting their temperature probe between the turbine blades. This gauge, I have no idea where it came from. It's a turbine inlet temperature, so this temperature probe is just in front of the exhaust gas temperature, or just in front of the turbine blades. And I already mentioned that part. Dun, 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 dun. Oh yeah, if you uh, put the temperature probe is where it's the coolest, it'll probably last longer. That's service life. It'll last longer, have a longer service life. Thermocouples is the, uh, if you put two pieces of metal together, right there where they touch, if the two different pieces of metal, if the two pieces of metal are different kinds of metal, they'll generate a very, very small voltage and you can measure that and there's a relationship between the voltage and the temperature so you can use a thermocouple actually the probes are thermocouples and of course if you're downstream if we've got our turbine engine and we've got a temperature probe right here and it breaks it's going to go through the turbine blades and it might damage them which is another good reason why most aircraft engine manufacturers put their exhaust probe after the last turbine blade. So if it does happen to come apart, it won't it'll just blow out the engine and hit somebody in the eye instead of damaging the engine. Now the reason why there's multiple probes and they're connected in parallel, or you could just say they're connected together, is so that you can get a more accurate temperature. If you average all of these together, you'll get a more accurate temperature. And then the second reason is that if one of these fails, you still have enough probes that it'll still get a good indication if it breaks. So it's very common to see multiple probes inside the back of an engine. Of course, if you're doing a pre-flight, it's going to read ambient. It's going to read essentially outside air temperature. Of course, the problem with some gauges is they don't go that low. For instance, here, I'll show you an engine gauge here. This is in degrees Celsius, and these are in hundreds. It doesn't show up very well, but there's actually 100 in here. So right there is 100 degrees Celsius and we don't usually see atmospheric temperatures that high. I think 37 degrees Celsius is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So 
the needle would be pointing down here below the uh, 100 degree line. I've never seen a turbine engine that had an exhaust gas temperature gauge rated in Fahrenheit. Even old 1940s, 1950s jet engines, they were rated in Celsius. Now, here's what I find interesting, is that it's very common to have two red lines on an EGT gauge. Here's an, an EGT gauge, it's ITT, but it's telling us the same thing. This one right here, this is for start. Oops, I can't spell start. And this gate, this line right here is for all other operations. Whether it's takeoff, idle, cruise, shutdown, whatever it is, all other operations. Uh, I have seen some jet engines where it's the other way around, where the lesser number was for start and the higher number was for all other operations. Here is the exhaust gas temperature gauge out of an MD-80 something or other and here's a red line and here's a red line typically on bigger engines you don't have to write this down the lower red line is for start and the higher red line is for all others and for smaller engines the higher red line is for start and the other is for all other operations and I've seen some EGT probes EGT gauge that di only showed one and you just had to know the uh, and it was typically for all other operations and you had to have memorized the EGT red line for start so be careful which red line you're going to use when you're starting the engine. RPM gauges or tachometers telling you how fast the thing is spinning. Uh, there were some old school engines where they actually told you 5,000 RPMs, 10,000 RPMs, but now all RPM gauges are going to say in percent of revolutions. 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and it's going to be percent. RPMs in percent. In fact, I think I have some pictures. Here is a typical jet engine gauge. It looks pretty old. Here's 10 percent. You'll notice it says percent RPMs. And this needle isn't very accurate. So what happens is as this needle um, goes to 10, you'll see this needle go all the way around once. So if you wanted to set 11 percent RPM, you get the needle pretty close here to 11 and you'd have this little needle pointing at 1. Or let's say you wanted 95 RPMs. Here's 90, 92, 94, or correction, 1, 2, 3, 4, wow, 2, 4, 6, 8, oops, and here's 110. So 95 ought to be in the middle here. So you're going to run this big needle up so it's pointing right between 100 and 90 and you're going to push it, this little needle, until it's pointing at 5. This is a very typical way for analog gauges, that is round gauges with real needles in them to spin, is that as this needle moves each 10, this little needle will move one revolution and you'll actually use this one to be accurate. If you wanted to set 82 RPM, you'd get the needle somewhere above 80 and you'd push it up until the needle pointed at 2. There's a lot could a lot of ways to mark an RPM gauge. If you have a two spool engine, you're going to have N1 and N2. If it's a Rolls-Royce RB211 or a Trent 800 like on the they put on the Rolls-Royce engine that goes on the 777, uh it's going to have three spools, N3. However, they may say, "You know what? If you were going to set takeoff power settings, whoops. We're going to set takeoff power settings with the fan, instead of calling it N1, they might call it the fan, even though, of course, we know that that's also N1. Also, if you're going to fly, and I think I got an example or two here. Whoops, I'll sorry, show you the next example. Here we go. Here's N1. This is out of an MD-80 series airplane. Interestingly enough, you'll notice the red line. Here's 100, but the red line is a little bit higher than that. It looks like, uh, let's see, 90, 2, 4, 6, let's see, 80, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 90, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Here's 100. Looks like there's a yellow line at 98, and it looks like the red line is about 101 or at 102. So the red line may not be at 100%. Here's N2. 
out of the same engine. And remember, they're calibrated in percents. Let's say you're flying a turboprop. Now, we haven't covered this yet, but just for fun, let's say that you run the shaft all the way through the turboprop and run it off of a couple of turbines, and you're still going to need a propeller gear reduction box. And you have a compressor. And a, tur and a compre com Okay. The first thing that the air hits and everything hitting, touching it and bolted onto it is N1. The air keeps going. It finally gets to here. You could call this N2, but it's also N2 is driving the propeller. So if you look at the RPM gauges, they're probably going to call this one a prop gauge. And although they call it, could call this N1, they're probably going to call it NG. G stands for gas producer. You need to understand that the whole purpose of this part of the engine, which happens to be NG, wow, it's like I planned it that way, this gas producer is producing high velocity gases to go through these turbines or power turbines just to drive the propeller. So in the cockpit, if you knew what the propeller RPM was, and this was in percents, then you'd know what percent RPM the N2 is being spun as well. So you only need one gauge for the propeller, the gear reduction box, and the N2 turbines. And then you'd need one more RPM gauge for the gas producer, that portion of the engine, the compressor, the combustion section, and the turbines that are producing ga high velocity gases to drive the turbines that end up driving the propeller. So I've got here is a uh, RPM gauge out of a Pratt & Whitney PT-6, and I know this isn't that great of a picture, but here's NG, and it's in percent, and here's a red line. Here's interesting. Here's 60, 70, 80, 90, 2, 4, 6, 8. Here's 100 percent, and you'll notice the red line is a little bit above 100%. So jet engine RPMs are not always at 100%. Here is the same engine, a PT-6, and this time they didn't put it in percent. They put it in RPM, but somewhere, somehow, you could calculate how fast the turbine was spinning. And, of course, it's got a red line. Looks like it's got a green arc. And you'll notice how slow it's going. This is 2,000 RPMs right here, red line is a little lower than that. It looks like it's about 1800 RPM. Of course, the bigger the diameter, the slower you're going to have to spin it. Otherwise, you have all those those drag problems with tip speeds. And we already looked at the N1s and N2s. Okay, so the RPM gauge the RPM gauge is going to be the primary thrust indicator on some turbofans and in that case it's probably going to be the fan, or they might call it N1, and some turbojets. It's probably just, if it's a turbo old turbojet, it probably only has one RPM gauge, since it's probably just a single spool engine. And that's how you, how you would set takeoff power, would be by setting the uh, RPM of the fan or RPM of the engine. And, of course, I already said it may not be exactly at 100%. Engine pressure ratio, or EPR. Engine pressure ratio is a different way to determine how much thrust the engine is producing. If you have a turbojet, you're either going to set the takeoff power or other power settings with the RPM gauge of N1, or if you just got one spool, the RPM gauge, or you're going to use an engine pressure ratio gauge. Same thing with the turbofan. There are some turbofans where they use N1 or the fan to set the power, and there are some that use engine pressure ratio. Engine pressure ratio gauges measure the pressure, the total pressure inside the intake and the total pressure inside the exhaust pipe.
and they compare the two. They don't probes don't really look like this, but this makes you look like an airspeed indicator. And of course, pressure total, you know, that's effectively uh pressure due to velocity and pressure due to static pressure combined in the exhaust pipe is going to be greater than that in the intake when the engine is running. Remember to get thrust, area of the jet, pressure in the jet minus pressure ambient. Hopefully the pressure in the jet is higher than the pressure out in front of the airplane. And of course weight of the air over acceleration due to gravity V2 minus V1 where V1 is the velocity coming in the engine and V2 is the velocity leaving the engine so the velocity ought to be higher and the static pressure ought to be higher in the exhaust compared to the intake so the pressure in the EPR probe in the exhaust pipe it ought to be noticeably higher so the gauge that EPR gauge is going to give you a measurement of total pressure and this is typically engine station number five or engine station number seven and around here is engine station number two so EPR is typically total pressure at engine station number five divided by pressure total at engine station number two or it might be if this is a seven so it depends every engine they mark the engine slightly different that's going to be EPR now interestingly enough if the engine's not running, the velo the pressure going into the exhaust probe, total pressure going into the exhaust probe is the same as the total pressure going into the intake. So typically EPR, the lowest it'll go is at or near 1, and takeoff EPR might be somewhere around 2. It varies by engine, and it varies every day. You're actually going to have to look it up based on the, the uh, pressure altitude and the temperature, and it'll tell you what your takeoff power setting is going to be. I got a slide here. And here I'll show you about engine stations. I got this off the NASA website. This is just one engine with different station numbers on it. Uh, here, you know, right in here, you might call it, somebody might call that two or just in front of the compressor. Here's engine station number five. Obviously, number seven might be somewhere here. So we could put our EPR probe. We could put our EPR probe right here in front of the compressor, and we could put an EPR probe here in the tailpipe. And of course, they got some nice fun numbers down there, too. So, engine station numbers are talking about different positions along the engine. Uh, unlike the datum, where they pick a spot and then every place is just so many inches past, the engine manufacturers. Are just going to say, well, this is engine station two, here's three, here's four, here's five, here's six, here's seven, and every engine manufacturer picks, does it slightly different. So that's why you'll see some EPRs are PT7 divided by PT2, and some will be PT5 divided by PT2. Excuse me, because engine manufacturers put their probes at different spots and they call their engine stations don't mark them all at the same spot. I don't need to see that again. And of course the higher the EPR, the higher the thrust. Yay! Here is a diagram. This right here is 1.0 and this is just a diagram it's saying if you ran this thing up to 2.2 right here and you notice there's a triangle here there's going to be a knob on the side and you get to adjust this bug back and forth. You're going to look it up in advance. Here is the EPR gauge. I know it's not a very good picture. Here's an EPR out of an MD-80 and the engine's probably not running because the EPR's down at 1.0 or if the engine's running it's not developing that much thrust so the gauge is not going to be much higher than 1. And here's the bug. Here's the bug. And you get to rotate this knob to set the bug. So you're going to look it up in advance and set this. So on takeoff, you just push the power lever up until your needle hits the takeoff bug that you previously set. Torque meters. Torque meters are going to be the primary 
instrument to tell you power if you're flying a helicopter or a turboprop. They are for turboprop and turboshaft engines because you're worried about how much power is getting to that shaft out there either driving that helicopter transmission or driving that propeller. Torque, if uh, you don't have to write this down, but horsepower equals RPM times torque. So there's a definite relationship between torque and horsepower and really torque is a uh, torque is telling you how much force is occurring which is what we're worried about we're worried about force and I've seen gauges calibrated in pounds per square inch foot pounds percent I've even seen some in horsepower I got an example here I think this one's out of uh, a helicopter you'll notice it's in percent and here's a red line and a riello arc and wow green arc's pretty big Here's another one. This one's out of a, uh, an old turboprop. It's in foot-pounds of torque. And here's a red line. I can't tell if there's any green arc. And then it's got a huge green arc. It goes all the way around. And it's just essentially trying to tell you how much torque there is. And torque's measured in foot-pounds. And here's a torque gauge that's in pounds per square inch. And of course, it operates a lot like an RPM gauge is, a tachometer as you increase the RPM every 10 or 50 this is going to spin around the little needle is going to spin around so you can set it more accurately if you want to and here's another one in foot pounds this is off of Pratt & Whitney PT6 I'm going to have to look up and see why there's two red lines probably one for takeoff and one for maybe 30 minutes is my first guess and they've got foot pounds times 100 and of course they've got a really big green arc. And what I do want you to understand is that torque meters measure the twist of something inside of the engine. If we have our classic turboprop engine, the shaft is going to come out, there's going to be a reduction gearbox, and then there's going to be a big propeller. Somewhere in this gearbox between the power coming in from the engine and the power going out to the propeller there's going to be a lot of gears and a lot of shafts and if with that some shaft in there we're going to be adding energy to it let's say it's going to be rotating that shaft well this shaft is going to bend or torsion just a little tiny bit so on this end it won't rotate quite as far it's like if uh, somebody grabs your arm with both hands and uh, and they rotate your skin in this direction and with the other hand they rotate it in the other direction some kind of a burn um, that's torsioning your skin right there okay a torque meter is actually measuring how much this shaft gets torsioned or twisted and then that gets displayed in the cockpit there is a method a sensor and there's more than one way to do it and we're not going to get into that for you for a um, uh, an engineer to design a system to measure what's getting bent or twisted inside of that engine. Fuel flow gauges. Yeah, you get it. You, if you're used to flying the Cessna 172 S model, I believe it, it's fuel injected and it has a fuel flow gauge. That's not common for most little airplanes. Um, to have fuel flow gauges. You get into bigger piston twins and it's common for them to have fuel flow gauges but it's not very common on small single engine piston powered airplanes until you get into the fuel injected ones. Oh wait, the S model is fuel injected. Um, on those it uses pressure but then they calibrate it in pounds per hour. Fuel flow gauges on jets are all calibrated in pounds per hour not gallons per hour I guess on that on uh, piston powered airplanes they're not calibrated in pounds per hour they're calibrated in gallons per hour or PPH pounds per hour sometimes it'll be capital F capital F for fuel flow here is an example of a fuel flow gauge you know it's pounds per hour and then it says times a hundred so ten times a hundred ten times a hundred equals a thousand pound whoops pounds per hour or you could say the fuel flow equals a thousand because we're going to do things in pounds. Here's another fuel flow gauge, except this one here. It says pounds per hour times a, th a thousand. So right here, this would be a thousand pounds per hour already.
or you could say fuel flow equals a thousand and you notice look at that gauge goes up to 12 woohoo lots of fuel there's another fuel flow gauge this is out of a Prattman EPT6 pounds per hour times a hundred I don't know what uh, power setting it's at but this is about 220 pounds per hour here's a fuel flow gauge I know that's a lousy picture out of an MD80 you'll notice as well as this needle going to be spinning around so you can have a rapid indication there's also going to be a digital or a uh, a numeric readout of fuel flow so you can get it really accurate now there's two basic types of fuel flow gauges I'm not going to ask you to write this on the test but let's say the fuels coming in here from the fuel tank and here it's going to the engine There's going to be a plate right here, and then there's going to be a pivot with a plate that can move back and forth. The fuel has to go around the plate to get to the engine. If we pump more fuel, if we let more fuel to the engine, there's only a small area down here. The only way we can let more fuel in is if this vein moves over, and now there's a very large area for fuel to go through. And if we measure the rotation of that shaft, and as this shaft rotates, we can have a fuel flow gauge and have this needle rotate at the same time. Then we could have an indication of how much fuel is getting to the engine. Now this is called a vane type fuel flow transmitter. I'm not going to expect you to draw it on the test. The problem with the vane type fuel flow transmitter is that it measures volume. If the fuel is hot or cold, it's going to be inaccurate. So we're going to say that in typical, in general, if you look in a pilot operating handbook or an approved flight manual and it says it has a vane type fuel flow transmitter, you're going to go, okay, it's probably accurate plus or minus 3%. If you have a an impeller or motorless mass type of fuel flow measuring system, it measures mass, which is much more accurate, and you're going to say, okay, that's better that's going to be telling me and I have an accuracy of plus or minus one percent and of course I already told you about FF fuel flow is an, is an indirect but pretty good indicator of engine power if we have EPR and we run it up to takeoff and we have a fuel flow gauge and typically we'll just say you burn 10,000 pounds an hour at takeoff then if you wanted to look at the EPR gauge and go, hmm, I wonder how accurate it is, if you had a habit pattern of looking at the fuel flow gauge every time you set takeoff power and the needle kept coming up to 10,000 pounds per hour every time, if you wondered if the EPR gauge was accurate, you could check and go, oh, well, the fuel flow is burning the right amount of fuel, so we're probably developing the same amount of thrust. There's not a perfect linear... Um, relationship between fuel flow and thrust but it's pretty close in general the higher the fuel flow the higher the thrust so just to make sure I got this right I recommend that you get into a habit pattern that when you set takeoff power the very next gauge you look at uh, you need to look at the fuel flow gauge and tell you to and take a and make an estimation is this the about correct is this the approximate amount of fuel that ought to be burning oil temperature gauges I've seen them in Fahrenheit or Celsius these days are probably going to mostly be in Celsius and it's typically they put the temperature probe as the fuel the, the oil is entering the engine here's a gauge this is out of a Pratt & Whitney PT6 here's oil pre uh, temperature in degrees Celsius of course a low red line a high red line a green arc and a yellow arc. Wow, minus 40 degrees Celsius, that's the same as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Oil pressure. Uh, if you remember the chapter on lubrication, the reservoir and if you have labyrinth oil seals uh, are pressurized by bleed air so it's going to be a slightly higher pressure than outside ambient so the oil pressure gauge is going to tell you the pressure coming out of the pump minus the pressure in the reservoir and that's what it's going to tell you
so that gauge in uh, oil pressure if we have a reservoir and there's fluid in here and say there's 50 psi bleed air pressure in it and the pump takes it out and pumps it to the engine at 150 psi but inside of the engine some of the parts in here are pressurized to 50 psi due to the same bleed air then actually 150 oops, 150 minus 50 would equal 100 psi so this gauge would read 100 psi and that's pretty typical to have the uh, oil pressure be a difference of the pressure in the reservoir versus the pressure coming out of the pump and it's typically in pounds per square inch here's an old pressure gauge out of a Pratt & Whitney PT6 here's a high red line here's a low red line a yellow arc a green arc which obviously things are going to operate most of the time in there and you notice here if here's 85 here's 90 100 110 120 so green arc in here is about 85 to 110 is the green arc and that's in PSI if you fly a bigger airplane uh, that's a reciprocating engine like you fly that DC-3 or that C-47 out of the airport uh, it burns so those big radial engines burned a lot of oil they had a big oil tank I think a DC-3 a C-47 had a 10 gallon not 10 quart 10 gallon a 40 quart reservoir because it would burn a lot and leak a lot in flight and you wanted to keep an eye on it jet engines also commonly have oil quantity gauges even smaller jet engines they might be calibrated in quarts or gallons doesn't make that much of a difference uh, but running out of oil in a piston engine if you run out of oil in a piston engine definitely it's going to damage the engine it'll probably seize up and stop moving uh, but if you're only running at 2500 rpm 2500 rpm and the engine seizes up and what's spinning doesn't have that much inertia anyway it's not going to be that big of a deal other than of course the engine is ruined but if you're in a turbine engine a turbine powered aircraft and that turbine you gotta remember most of the weight of a turbine engine is the rotating parts and so that gives it more inertia and it's not just spinning 2500 it could be spinning 25,000 rpm so you have more weight spinning and it's spinning at a higher rpm so the inertia is many 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 times higher than the inertia for the rotating components in a piston engine if the bearings holding onto the shaft the roller bearings the ball bearings holding onto the shaft if those didn't get lubricated and they started wearing out and breaking up and the engine seized all of that momentum would had to go would have to go somewhere internal engine parts would go flying you would very likely have what's called an uncontained failure a contained failure is when the engine breaks and uh, nothing leaves the engine a con an uncontained failure is when parts come out of the engine and that's what would happen if you ran out of oil in a jet engine the engine would seize and you would have an uncontained failure I hate it when that happens piston engines vibrate much much more especially much per, more per horsepower than jet engines do jet engines don't vibrate nearly as much because most of what's spinning is only spinning around in a perfect circle and the pistons aren't going up and down there is no reciprocating motion um, and if they are vibrating it's probably because something is wrong so it's very common to have engine vibration sensors on the engine maybe in two or three different places and to have some kind of a cockpit readout for the pilots if it goes above the red line typically what the approved flight manual is going to say is to pull the engine back to idle and leave it there then that's kind of nice I probably wouldn't want to shut the engine down if I had to in case for some reason I needed uh, another needed that engine to give me power what if the good engine on a twin engine airplane failed I'd rather have an engine that's vibrating running when the engine quits than an engine that's shut down when the other engine quits so most of the time it's going to say pull the engine to idle obviously you'll ride it up and somebody's going to have to fix it before the airplane flies again
Instrument markings, you know, they're pretty pretty standard. Red lines are never exceed. Don't go any faster than that. Typically, uh, we have green arcs. which means uh, normal operating or you can operate it there as long as you want to and you may get yellow arcs in fact if you had a yellow arc right here the then probably what this means is that this red line is never exceed let's just say it's on a torque meter for a helicopter The red line is going to be never exceed this 30, this uh, yellow arc. Yellow arc essentially means you can operate under certain conditions. If it's an airspeed indicator, you can operate in the yellow arc as long as it's not too turbulent. Uh, on a helicopter, in addition to having takeoff power, which this red line is also going to be likely to be takeoff power, uh, there's probably going to be the next lowest or the next highest power setting which is going to be a 30 minute setting you can operate inside of the yellow arc for up to 30 minutes because helicopters have to use a lot of power in a hover and they might have to sit there and hover for a while uh, but no more than 30 minutes and then the rest of the time you'd have to be operating in the green arc so red radial lines are never exceed green arcs are normal operation yellow arcs are uh, caution you can operate in this range under certain conditions If you have any questions about jet engine instruments, please get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to improve this lecture, get a hold of me as well. Thank you.